Now, let me introduce today's presenters. Jack Curl holds a Bachelor's of Science degree in Electrical Engineering from Worcester Polytechnic Institute. In 1990, Jack entered the motion control industry as an applications engineer for CMC Torque Systems. He moved on to Pacific Scientific in 1994 to later become Applications Engineering Manager. Jack went to work at Elmo Motion Control in 2006 as a field automation engineer and in 2007 came to Infinor Incorporated currently as Senior Systems Engineer. Robert Bob Comstock holds Bachelor's and Master's degree in Electrical Engineering from MIT. Prior to entering the motion control field, he worked in the aerospace industry at General Dynamics, Raytheon, and the MIT Instrumentation Laboratory, later to become Draper Laboratory. Bob left Draper Labs in 1980 to become engineering manager of IMET Corporation, specializing in the design of drive electronics for brushless permanent magnet and induction motors. In addition to electronics design, Bob managed the application support group and worked with many customers to select the best motion control solutions for a wide range of applications. Currently, Bob has his own consulting company and is working with Infranor. Our leadoff presenter, Dan Dekilla, holds a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from Northeastern University. He started in the motion control field in 1987 as an applications engineer with Pacific Scientific, later Danaher Motion. He went on to hold positions of field applications engineer, field sales engineer, regional sales manager, application engineering manager, marketing specialist, product marketing specialist, and program manager. He joined Infranor Incorporated in 2007 and is currently the general manager. Ladies and gentlemen, let me present Dan Tequila. Hi, Robert. Thanks very much, and welcome, everyone, to our webinar. Today, what we're going to do is try to give you some, some overview uh, on sizing, and we're going to use a basic example and walk you through that example because I think that's the best way to learn. And uh, we only have an hour, so we're going to be somewhat quick, uh, but I think what you'll find is um, uh, that the seminar will help you with a lot of uh, basic applications, and I think if there's more, there'll be a lot of reference material at the end. We're going to go through the, the steps of the uh, overview here are, uh, first we're going to talk about the uh, customer app uh, requirements and how that affects our motor selection. We're going to go through the motion profiles. We're going to talk about velocity versus time profiles. We're going to uh, go through calculations for speed and acceleration, as well as peak torque and system inertia. We're going to talk a little bit about understanding the motor torque versus speed curves. Then we're going to calculate the continuous torque, torque, continuous torque and go on to the motor selection. Also throughout this uh, webinar, you'll notice little, uh, little and sometimes very large yellow uh, call-outs. These are helpful hints, so please pay attention. Okay, we're going to go through a brushless servo sizing application today. And really, though, the principles that we're going to apply will apply to many different technologies. Uh, when we do go through this process, there's three things that we're really going to be after. We're going to try to calculate the maximum speed of the application, the maximum, the peak torque, and the continuous torque. Because really, if you can calculate those three things, that's really all you need to uh, choose an appropriate motor. We, our basic application, this is something we made up for this uh, example. It's a rotary uh, inspection table. There is a, a disc that's loaded by an operator onto the table. The, uh, it rotates one revolution. There is a sensor that measures concentricity and um, that's the basic application that we're going to go through. It's a purely rotary application. This is a, just a top view to make sure you understand what the application looks like. The disc here is shown in a semi-transparent view so you can see underneath it. So the customer requirements here are that they want to process 40 parts per minute. So we say we convert that and say that equates to a little under one part per second, 0.667 parts per second. The inverse of that is 1.5 seconds per part. This is our cycle time, and this is the full process time for each part. Uh, please know that 
we have we know that it takes six tenths of a second to load and another six tenths of a second to unload the part. So the motion profile looks like this. Basically, we plot the velocity of the motor on the y-axis and versus time on the x-axis. If the motor were to rotate counterclockwise, that would show up as a negative velocity. Now, in this case, the motor only rotates in one direction, does one revolution, and stops. So if we look at the profile, we have six-tenths of a second to load the motor and another six-tenths of a second to unload the motor. That only leaves us with three-tenths of a second to actually rotate the part. There we go. So if we focus on the motion, the move portion of this, and we break it down a bit further, you see that we, what we're using is a one-third, one-third move profile. There's a, basically, the reason we do this is it's a perfect starting point. You can always adjust this move profile later, but if this is the right starting point because typically it selects the smallest motor possible for the application. Um, and now we're going to get into the heavy calculations, and I'm going to pass the, the uh, console over to Bob Comstock, who's going to take it from here. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, and welcome to everybody. Well, we are going to start by calculating the uh, maximum speed, but before we get into that, I want to say a few uh, words about units. We uh, will be using metric, MKS, meters, kilograms, second units in this presentation, and we strongly recommend that you use those in your calculations. Using English units often leads to some pretty big errors. I'll just say a few words about uh, one of those a little bit later in the presentation. These are the units that uh, we will be using. Um, I think probably most of you are familiar with them. Uh, uh, we do have uh, in Appendix uh, A1, a uh, list of conversion factors from uh, maybe some of the units you're more familiar with. Some of you may find using radians per seconds or we abbreviate rad per second less than two of an RPM for angular velocity, but radians per second and the corresponding acceleration, radians per second squared are what we have to use uh, for calculating torque, as we'll see in just a little while. Uh, to give you a feel, if you're not too used to uh, radians per second, a simple rule of thumb that uh, you'll only be about a little less than 5% off uh, uh, to use it is just to divide speed and RPM by 10, and you get uh, pretty close to the radians per second. I just want to make a comment here that we will be using the word inertia to mean moment of inertia. Uh, inertia can mean different things to different people, but moment of inertia is the... Uh, uh, is what we'll be referring to here when we use inertia. Okay, we're now at a point where we can look at detail at our motion profile. Uh, what you haven't uh, seen in front of you is our velocity versus time profile. If you look first at the green section of the plot, uh, that's the constant velocity section. I think we can all agree. Excuse me. Yeah, this is the geometry uh, review, but it's our... Uh, uh, velocity versus time profile, and uh, we've emphasized the different sections. Um, I think we can all agree, looking at the green section, when we're running at a constant velocity, that the distance we move there is, is simply the velocity times the time. If we were doing one rev per second for one second, we're going to go one rev. That would be the distance we travel. In this case, we have a constant velocity for a tenth of a second, so it's going to be uh, the distance traveled in that segment is V times 0.1. Uh, note that that is simply the area under the green uh, rectangle. And in general, uh, we can say that the distance traveled through any velocity versus time plot is the area under the curve. Uh, those of you who had and remember of, uh, a little bit of calculus, remember that uh, that's the integral, basically, of uh, velocity versus time plot, and that gives you the uh, distance. So now, using that, we can look at the two triangular segments, and we can see that the uh, distance traveled in each is the area under the tr uh, triangle, so in each case, that's one-half the base times the height, and that would give us the distance traveled of 0.1 seconds times the velocity over two uh, for each of those triangle sections. If you're uncomfortable with the area under the curve, another way to think about that is that uh, if you have a linear acceleration starting at zero, uh, just a constant acceleration, the average velocity would be one-half uh, the velocity that you'd reach at the peak. 
So that's another way of uh, convincing yourself that the uh, distance traveled in the triangular section would be uh, uh, v over two times the time. So now we have enough information to uh, calculate our, our speed based upon the, uh, the findings on the previous uh, chart. Uh, we see that uh, we have a distance traveled in the first triangle section of 0.1 times v over 2. In the rectangular seg uh, segment, we have 0.1 times v. In the uh, last triangular section, 0.1 times v over 2, and that all has to add up to 1 rev. That gives us an equation of 0.2 times the velocity equals 1 revolution, and we can solve that by dividing both sides of the equation by 0.2. And that gives us a uh, uh, top speed of five revs per second. Uh, since we all know there's 60 seconds in a minute, uh, we can say that top speed, if we want to think in terms of RPM, uh, units we all, all love, <laughs> is uh, 300 RPM. Now we've talked about the, uh, the uh, suck speed, and now we have to consider the motor speed. And uh, this is a, an interesting application for a servo motor, particularly brushless servo motors uh, have a characteristic that they maintain their torque out there to very high speed. And if you want to get the most out of a brushless servo motor, the best thing to do is let it run fast, because if you uh, think about power in a linear system, maybe uh, everybody remembers that power is uh, basically speed times uh, force. In a rotary system, it's um, angular speed, angular velocity times torque. So at high speed, if we can get torque out at high speed, we can get a lot of power out of the servo motor. Turns out that motor size and cost are closely related to their, uh, their torque rating, how much torque they can put out. Uh, but if you can run fast and get a lot of power by uh, gearing down a motor, either a belt or whatever system, you can get a lot out of a smaller motor. And finally, uh, you might note that the disc and chuck have a pretty large radius. Um, we'll see shortly that a large radius implies a very high inertia. So we have a pretty high inertia to accelerate. Uh, that would imply a lot of torque on the uh, disc itself, but as we see shortly, gearing down gives us a, a big advantage. Uh, if you gear down n to 1 uh, in, in gearing or belting, you get n times as much torque on the load as the motor has to put on. So uh, looking at all this, uh, we basically selected a gear reduction of 20 to 1 in the mechanical system. Now, if that's true, uh, then the motor has to turn 20 times as fast as the chuck does. We had that the uh, chuck is, uh, is spinning at a maximum speed of 300 RPM. That means our motor has to go to 6,000 RPM, which may sound pretty fast, but that's really not that fast for a servo motor, especially a brushless servo motor. We'll be talking more about torque versus speed uh, curves in a little, little while and get into a lot more detail. As we'll see shortly, we need to know the angular acceleration, which we've called alpha, to calculate the torque required for our load. In our example, we need to accelerate the motor to a speed of 6,000 RPM, or 100 revs per second, in a tenth of a second. Therefore, our angular acceleration is 1,000 revs per second squared. But remember, uh, we want to use MKS units and uh, metric units, and the, uh, the unit we're going to have to use for acceleration, angular acceleration, is radians per second square. Remembering that there are two pi radians of one revolution, we have that our angular acceleration is uh, two pi times 1,000 or 6,285 radians per second square. So at this point, we've calculated our maximum uh, chuck speed and our maximum motor speed. Now uh, we have to calculate the peak torque and speed. I think we're all familiar with the relation uh, force equals mass times acceleration. Uh, probably we learned most of that, in, or most of us learned that in high school. Uh, but even uh, here, I want to get back to a little bit to the uh, discussion on units. Even there, you have to be careful. Uh, the equation is true if we give force in newtons, mass in kilograms, and acceleration in meters per second squared. 
But it's not true if we give force in pounds, mass in pounds, pounds as we weigh them on our bathroom scale, and acceleration in feet per second squared. That's because a one-pound force accelerates a one-pound mass. Again, it's something that would weigh on our bathroom scale at about 32 feet per second squared. These are the kind of things that make using English units a, a real problem. So, um, uh, again, we really emphasize do your, calcul uh, do your calculations in, uh, in the metric units. And if you need to get back to English units, foot pounds, and that sort of thing, when you get done, just use the conversion table to go back. Now, I think we're all pretty familiar with the concept of torque. Uh, I think we know if we apply a tangential force F in the distance R from the uh, center of a shaft, center of a bolt, for example, if we have a, a wrench uh, that's one foot long, we apply a force of one pound at the end of the wrench, we have one foot pound of torque. Again, we'll be using newtons and meters, but uh, that's the concept of, uh, of torque, and I think we're pretty familiar with that. Now, the... Uh, Equation, uh, we have the rotary uh, version of F equals MA, tells us that if we have a torque and uh, what we're going to call the moment of inertia, uh, that the uh, angular acceleration, alpha angular, is going to be uh, torque over J, or J, or torque is going to be J times the, uh, uh, the angular acceleration. But that doesn't give us too much of a feel at this point for what J, the uh, moment of inertia, is. But we can see that the, uh, the bigger the moment of inertia, the more torque is required to get a given acceleration. So inertia plays the same role as mass in a linear system. The higher the inertia, the harder it is to get it spinning. Now, Now, shown in Appendix 2, uh, it's found it's too time-consuming to go through the details here, but it's shown that if we have a point mass um, M, that would be in uh, kil uh, kilograms, a distance R from the center of rotation, that it has a moment of inertia equal to R squared, the square of the distance from the center times the mass. If you use that as a value for the inertia, then our equation uh, torque equals the moment of inertia times the angular acceleration is valid. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm not going to prove that here. I'll just ask you to accept it at this point. And if you want a proof, uh, go to the uh, appendix two. We're going to use that result uh, to calculate the uh, inertia of the cylinder. Uh, that's a somewhat more involved calculation. Uh, there's a little bit more information about that in Appendix 2, but if you accept that the uh, inertia of a mass at given distance r from the, the uh, center of rotation is r square m, then we can basically uh, make up the cylinder by a lot of little rings, um, each ring being a given distance from the center. So the rings keep going out from the center to the very outside. And we can uh, say that the the uh, contribution of the total inertia from each one of those little rings is uh, equal to the mass of that ring uh, times the uh, square of the distance from the center. So we really want to sum up the, uh, the inertia of all those little rings. We can just add them up, but since it's a continuous thing, we have to integrate. And I showed the integration up there. You don't have to follow it. Really, the only thing you really have to get at this point is that it works out that the inertia in kilogram meter squared is one half pi times L, which is the thickness of, this, of the cylinder, times the density of the material in uh, kilograms per uh, cubic meter, times, and here's the key thing, times the radius raised to the fourth power. Now, radius raised to the fourth, the fourth power, you can get a feel right away that that gets pretty big as the radius of the, of the cylinder increases. That's why I mentioned with the disc, it's a pretty good sized disc, and um, it's going to have quite a bit of inertia. Uh, again, if we use that formula for the inertia, then our uh, formula of uh, torque equals the moment of inertia times the angular acceleration in radians per second square will be valid. Okay, now that we have a formula for the inertia of a cylinder, we're going to calculate the inertias of our system components. We'll see that a 20 to 1 gear reduction will greatly reduce the inertia of the chuck and discs, 
as seen by the motor or is reflected back in the motor, and uh, that will be clear just what that means in just a minute or so. I'm just going to go through uh, one of the calculations um, in particular. It will be for the, uh, the uh, Chuck gear inertia. We had the radius was uh, 0.254 meters. Thickness was uh, 0.25 inches or 0 0.00635 meters. Serial is aluminum, and what the density is there. And using our formula, and uh, you can check this out later if you'd like, we can use the uh, one half pi L rho uh, radius to the fourth. We get the inertia is 0 0.113 kilogram meters squared. We do the same thing for the uh, disk. And uh, I'll just let you see the number there. This was uh, uh, 0 0.0549 kilogram meter square. And we also uh, do the same thing for the uh, drive gear. That's the gear that we're turning at the motor speed. Uh, so that is going to get to a pretty high speed and a pretty high uh, um, acceleration. The good thing about it is it's so small. You can see the number of zeros there that even though it's going to have to be uh, spun up quite fast and have pretty high acceleration. The inertia of that is so small that it can still be ignored. One thing we uh, haven't mentioned at this point, actually, yeah, go to motor inertia, um, is the uh, motor inertia itself. We're going to have to accelerate the, uh, the uh, motor up to 6,000 RPM, and uh, we're going to have to uh, include the torque that's required to do that in our final calculation to size the motor, but we don't know what the motor is at this point. So uh, what we're going to do is basically ignore that uh, for, for now, work out the, uh, and there's the, the torques that are required to accelerate the rest of our system, then uh, take a somewhat judicious choice of motors uh, usually this ends up being a somewhat iterative procedure. You pick a motor, if you find out that, uh, gee, if, if you didn't have to worry about the motor inertia, we could have done the job with no problem, but we can't accelerate both the load and the motor inertia at the same time, and so we're going to have to go to a somewhat bigger motor. Uh, we were really smart in this presentation, and we are going to pick a motor that will, will satisfy the requirement, but uh, that's just because we made a somewhat lucky guess. Well, key thing now is we have that 20 to 1 gear reduction between the motor and the chuck of the disc. And how does that affect um, the, uh, the torque load on the motor? Well, we know that the speed is increased. The motor speed is going to have to be 20 times the uh, speed of the disc and chuck. Um, we also know that the uh, acceleration torque, uh, the torque uh, that the motor has to put out, that uh, uh, Gets to the chuck is going to, it's going to get, chuck is going to get 20 times as much torque because of the gear reduction. As if you uh, gear the motor down 20 to one, the uh, the torque on the chuck will be 20 times the uh, the um, uh, motor inertia. Well, a very convenient way of uh, considering all that is to calculate what we call the reflected inertia, or the inertia reflected uh, from the load back to the motor. Well, how do we do that? What we can uh, uh, do is say the, uh, refle the uh, reflected uh, inertia, uh, what the motor sees is going to be the torque the motor has to put out divided by the acceleration of the motor. But we can figure out what that is because the uh, torque uh, that the motor has to develop to accelerate the load is going to be 1 20th. In our case, since we have a 21 gear reduction, it's going to be 1 20th of what we need to accelerate the uh, the uh, disc and the uh, chuck, but the uh, acceleration of the motor is going to be 20 times uh, what the, uh, the acceleration of the chuck uh, and disc are going to have. So we have that all lumped in that one equation. Uh, J reflected is the uh, load torque divided by 20, all divided by the load acceleration times 20, and what that gives us is that the reflected inertia back to the motor is actually the load, the inertia of the chuck and the uh, disc divided by 20 squared, and divided by the gear reduction squared. So we uh, mentioned before, there's a huge reduction in the uh, 
uh, and those are reflected back to the motor uh, having that 20 to 1 gear reduction. So we can see what that works out to be. We take the sum of the uh, disk inertia and the chunk inertia and divide it by 400, and we get a number of 0. 0.00042 kilogram meters squared. And just as an important note, any time you have a speed reduction, either with a belt or with, uh, in our case, a gear, the uh, inertia reflected back to the motor, or the effective inertia that the motor sees is reduced by that gear reduction squared. So, uh, again, you can get uh, big things by having a gear reduction, especially when you have a motor that can run at high speed. Well, now we can uh, calculate the torque that's required to accelerate the load because we know what the uh, inertia reflected back to the uh, motor is. Again, we're talking about the torque uh, to accelerate the load. We keep in the back of our minds there's going to be a, an additional torque required to accelerate the motor. What we have, again, uh, we've calculated the acceleration of the motor is uh, 6823 radians per second squared. And uh, we have now the uh, reflected inertia, the point zero 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 four two zero. So we have the torque is, again, the inertia times the acceleration, and that works out to be 2.64 newton meters. Quite often with a geared system, it can depend somewhat on the lubrication of the gears and the nature of the gear, but for this type of system, a reasonable uh, efficiency factor, really taking what the loss is uh, through the gear train is... Uh, uh, basically 15% or say that we have an efficiency factor of 0.85. So we've taken the uh, torque that we calculated divided by 0.85 and we say that we have a, uh, due to the losses in the gear train, we're going to assume that we need uh, a 3.11 meters. That's the 2.64 that we calculated divided by 0.85 for the efficiency factor. Okay, so we... Uh, have now uh, calculated the, uh, the torque that's required for the uh, uh, to accelerate the load. Now we want to start thinking more about the motor. Uh, the usual way of uh, characterizing a motor, in fact, uh, almost the standard way, uh, is to plot the motor's torque versus speed. And that tells us a lot of information about the motor. So we have sort of a generic uh, torque speed curve uh, in front of you now. Um, notice that there are two segments of the curve. Uh, the top segment is something called the peak torque, and that's the torque that we can get out of the motor for some short period of time. Uh, quite often, you might say that you can get peak torque for a second or so. It depends a lot on the application. Uh, but the motor is capable of putting that, out that amount of torque for a uh, short period of time. And a much lower curve is the continuous uh, uh, torque curve. And that curve is determined by uh, uh, the heating of the motor. Uh, whenever you're getting torque out of the motor, you're putting current into windings. That generates heat, and eventually the motor will heat up. Um, you can't uh, operate above the continuous uh, torque for indefinitely because eventually you will overheat the motor windings, and uh, the winding insulation might be damaged. Now, one uh, thing you might might jump right out at you is, okay, the torque goes out for some up to some speed, and then it begins to uh, fall off. Well, why is that? Basically, that's because as a motor spins, it generates a voltage that opposes uh, the current that you're trying to put into the winding. And the drive has some limit of voltage that it can put across the windings, and as you get faster and faster on the motor, uh, eventually, the drive just can't put as much uh, current into the winding. Torque, the torque of the motor is at least proportional to the winding current. There's something called the uh, torque constant, which is basically newton meters per amp. And to get that uh, torque out of the motor, you have to put the required current in. And if the drive just isn't able to get that current because of the uh, voltage uh, across the motor winding, it's generated by its rotation. It sends it acting as a generator and fighting that uh, current that you're trying to put in, uh, then your torque is going to drop off, and that's what's happening in this curve. Again, this is a, basically a generic curve. So let's see uh, how we would use a torque speed curve to uh, uh, evaluate our application. 
Okay, okay. Uh, this slide, you can see that we've uh, propelled our required speed in our case, this would be 6,000 RPM. Look at the torque speed curve, you see, uh, yeah, the peak torque has dropped down uh, some ex uh, somewhat, but not uh, completely. It's still uh, well over half the peak uh, torque, even at 6,000 RPM. And the continuous torque really hasn't dropped at all. So that's sort of our, the first thing we might look at, is make sure we're still within a reasonable region of the torque speed curve. Next thing we're going to look at, I mean, right now we're just going to look at it uh, generically, but we're going to see, uh, okay, what is the peak torque capability at our speed? And obviously that's going to have to be not only above the requirement for our load, but it's going to have to be high enough to accelerate our, our motor's inertia uh, also. And, and we haven't selected a motor yet, so we don't know that, but these are the sorts of things we're going to start looking at. And finally, the uh, continuous torque, as I mentioned, that hasn't dropped off at all, but we still have to make sure our application doesn't uh, exceed that continuous torque. Okay, so we're at a point now where we better pick a motor and uh, take a look at it and see whether it satisfies our uh, requirement. Remember, we still have to include the torque required to accelerate the motor's rotor inertia before we know the full torque requirement. And again, in general, that might be an iterative process. In, in this case, we're going to be lucky, but uh, we'll, we'll check that out in just a minute. Okay, first of all, we look at our uh, peak torque requirement. Well, we're in good shape. The, uh, the peak torque require, uh, required to accelerate the load, anyway, is way underneath the peak torque capability of the motor. So we're kind of got a good feeling that uh, we're going to be able to accelerate the motor inertia. We, we won't know that until we actually uh, you know, put, put that in there. Now, for this motor, uh, the manufacturer, for any motor, the, the uh, manufacturer will specify a, uh, a rotor inertia. For this particular motor, uh, it works out to be, that works out, it's given to us as uh, 0.00013 kilogram meter square. Again, we have to accelerate that up to 6,000 RPM in a uh, tenth of a second. Uh, so we can, um, we, we have calculated our um, uh, acceleration before, and uh, with that value of inertia, it turns out that the required torque is 0.813 newton meters. So we combine that with the inertia of the load that we already uh, uh, have been working with, the, um, uh, and we get that the peak motor torque is now going to be uh, uh, 3.11 plus the, uh, that was the old value, plus 0.817 uh, newton meters to accelerate the rotor inertia and we're up to uh, 3.93 newton meters. In general, uh, our recommendation uh, is to allow a 10% safety factor. In that case, uh, we're going to look for a peak uh, required motor torque of uh, the 3.93 we just calculated divided by 0.9 to give us a 10% safety factor, and that gives us 4.37 newton meters. That's what we're going to demand out of the, uh, the motor. Well, we were lucky. Um, we look at the motor's torque versus speed curve, and we can see that 4.37 newton meters is well within the range of the peak uh, area. The peak area would be the uh, sort of purple or pinkish uh, curve there, and you can see our target uh, torque, our, our required peak torque, including the motor inertia, is well under that. So we're in good shape, sh good shape there. But now we um, still have something else to worry about. No, well, we have calculated the peak torque, and uh, we're in good shape there. Now we have to worry about that thing we call the continuous torque. And that's basically, uh, uh, we can certainly accelerate the, uh, the uh, load uh, without a problem, but now we have to see, are we going to overheat the motor if we, uh, if we do uh, run this cycle? We could run the cycle, of course, less frequently and, and, and still accelerate just as fast, uh, but we have to make sure we can meet the overall customer requirement of, uh, of running this cycle as often as, as specified. Well, the motor's continuous torque is limited by the maximal, uh, the maximum allowable winding temperature. 
I mentioned before, uh, if the windings get too hot, uh, what, what generally fails is the insulation. You'll end up with a short between windings because the insulation will have burned away. Well, motor torque, uh, again, is proportional to the winding current. And uh, the heating of the, of the motor is largely due to what the uh, electrical engineer would call the I square R losses. Uh, you might remember that if you have a resistance R and you put a current through it, the power dissipated is uh, equal to I squared, amp squared times the resistance in ohms. So uh, because torque is proportional to current, uh, what we really have to worry about is the, uh, the, the square of the torque, the current, the current square is going to be proportional to the torque square. So therefore, we have to calculate something called the RMS torque uh, for our application and make sure that that is not over the uh, continuous rating of the motor. Well, what does RMS torque uh, really mean? Basically, uh, if we apply the RMS torque continuously for the motor all the time, uh, that should generate the same amount of heat as uh, the actual current that varies that we put into our motor windings. So what we're going to do is say that the RMS torque um, is derived by equating the power dissipated, which is basically the power times time, um, or really the energy dissipated, which is power times time, which ends up being proportional to the torque squared times time. Uh, and uh, we're going to uh, make that uh, be the same as the heat that would be generated by our actual torque sequence, the uh, torque that accelerates the load up and it decelerates it back down. Well, the uh, derivation is up there. Basically, what uh, we say is that the RMS torque times the uh, pole time is um, equal to the sum of, uh, uh, of the, uh, I'm sorry, the RMS torque squared times the total time is equal to the uh, individual torques, each of the segment torques, um, times their, uh, their time, the, uh, the cycle. So we add that the uh, torque RMS squared times T total is equal to the sum of each of the segments where we have to, have to generate um, uh, torque sum of the torque squared in, in each of those segments times the time of those segments. And if you solve for that equation for torque RMS, you get that uh, sort of messy looking square root there that uh, RMS torque is equal to the, uh, the square root of the sum of uh, the, the uh, torques in each of the segments times the time of the segment, the torque squared of each of the segments times the time of the segments divided by the uh, time, uh, the total time of the uh, cycle. Okay. Yeah, I think I was describing the, actually the previous slide. I'm sorry. Okay. So just uh, plugging into the equation that uh, was derived on, on slide 44, we uh, uh, put in the numbers, the square root of the Excel torque, which is applied for 0.1 second, plus the square root of the uh, decel torque times 0.1 second. Um, and then we, we included the torque during the constant velocity, but that's zero because we're not accelerating or decelerating anything. We just for completeness shows all three segments. Uh, added those all up, divided by the total time of the segment, 1.5, and took the square root of it. That gives us our uh, uh, RMS torque. We put in the numbers uh, that we derived without the safety factor, without the 10% the, the safety factor that we use when we calculated the peak torque requirement because we're going to put in a safety factor for the continuous torque as well. So we'd be sort of putting double safety factors in. We, we do include the 0.85 for the gear reduction. That's all included, but not the 10% safety factor we added at the very end for the peak torque. And uh, we get an RMS torque of 1.44 newton meters, but then we apply a 10% safety factor to it, and we get that the required motor uh, Continuous torque rating must be uh, the 1.44 divided by 0.9 or 1.6 newton meters. So we've calculated our continuous torque, and now we go back to our 
motor curve and uh, put, put our 1.6 meters uh, on the curve. We see it, it is below the continuous rating of the motor, and it does include the safety factor. So we do have a motor that meets the requirements, and we have selected a motor. And now I'm going to turn the uh, discussion over to Jack Curl. Yes, Jack, I believe you're online. Go right ahead. Okay. Sorry about that. We had some technical phone difficulty. Good afternoon. This is Jack Curl. I'm a uh, systems engineer for Infranor. And congratulations, you have just sized your first servo motor with uh, sizing 101. And, and uh, uh, now let's, now let's uh, uh, take a take quick, a quick look, look at, at uh, a drive, drive selection, selection to see if we see can, if come, can up come up with, with a, the, an appropriate, appropriate drive. drive. Okay, okay, we now we have, have a system, system curve, curve that, comes that comes from the manufacturer, from the manufacturer. And, this and this curve has, has some voltage, voltage lines, lines and some, and some torque, torque lines, lines where, where the continuous, continuous and peak, peak torques torque are shown on the system, system curve with a specific, with a specific amplifier. amplifier. In this case, it's an 11-amp 11 11 amplifier. amplifier. And, and we, we notice that, that the curve, curve has, has enough, enough continuous, continuous current, current for the motor, motor to, to, to meet its continuous, continuous required, required torque. torque. But it looks, but it like, looks the like the peak, peak torque, torque is a little bit over the available peak peak torque for the, for the system, system curve. curve. So, so what we should, what do, we should do is, is go, to go to the next, to the next size up size amplifier. amplifier. And you'll and notice on this on curve, curve with the 17, 17 amp, amp peak drive, peak drive we, have we have plenty of margin, margin for the application, for the application under, under all the all different, different curves that we have available for us. So... Congratulations. Congratulations. You have, you have a, good a good system, system for this application. this application. I want to I point want out to point that, out that uh, when you download, download the, the, the presentation, presentation after, after we're done, we're here, done here, uh, we, uh, do we do have, have some, some appendices, appendices available with more, more information, information included, included uh, uh, with, useful with useful conversion, conversion factors, factors uh, a section, uh, on, section understanding on understanding inertia, inertia and, a and a section on rotary, rotary to linear, linear conversion, conversion for those, for those of you that have, that linear, have linear applications. applications. In, summary, In summary, this example has allowed, has allowed you to picture, picture the, elements the elements involved in optimizing the system. system. Keep in mind, Keep in mind the inertia, the inertia contributes, contributes to peak to and continuous, and continuous torque, torque, and the, the, the diameter of the inertia, of the inertia can be a can killer. Be killer. So smaller, smaller is better. Is better. Also, also keep in mind you can utilize the motor's full power by running, by running at rated, rated speeds, speeds or higher, or higher speeds, speeds if the motor, if the motor can, can handle, handle it. it. We've covered, covered a lot of information, information in a short, in a short period, period of time. Of time. And, if, and you're if you're confused or you need or help, you, need you can help, always, you can always call, us. call us. Here's our Here's contact, contact information. information. And, and thank you thank for, you watching, for watching, watching and participating. And, participating. and I hope and I the hope information, information was useful. Was useful.
the feedback, the feedback form that will soon appear on your screen. Your screen. Uh, by the way, if you happen to have any pop-up blockers on your uh, browser, please disable those so you can receive this form or authorize it to come through. The form allows us to get your opinion about today's seminar and also any seminars that you might like to see in the future. So, uh, gentlemen, are uh, you ready to answer a few questions that come in from our audience? I believe so, yes. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. All right, let's start with the, the first question. Uh, Katie would like to know, how long could you apply the peak torque without damaging the motor? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's also a, a fairly complicated question. It, uh, Basically, uh, when you apply peak uh, current, the uh, motor temperature is going to start to rise, and there are actually two different time constants involved. The case of the motor would take quite a long time uh, for its temperature to rise. The windings, having much less thermal mass, their, their temperature will increase much more rapidly. Um, it, it depends very much on the application. If you're running very close to the uh, continuous torque rating, then you wouldn't want to apply peak current for a very long time because you're already pretty close to the uh, temperature where you might damage the insulation. If, on the other hand, you're well below the continuous torque rating, then you can apply uh, peak uh, current for a much longer time because you, you can allow the winding temperature to increase significantly. In general, uh, if you think of uh, uh, applying peak torque for something in the order of a second or so, uh, you're probably fine. If you uh, are going to apply it much longer than that, then uh, maybe in either case you really should check with an application engineer because uh, they will have some models uh, to evaluate it uh, precisely. Also point out that um, uh, I think all our motors have something called PTCs, uh, positive temperature coefficient resistors, built into the windings, and those uh, feed back to the drive, and if the winding gets too hot, uh, it will actually shut down the drive. Now, that's a great safety feature, so you don't damage your motor. On the other hand, it can be a great source of annoyance to uh, uh, somebody who wants the machine to keep running. I actually had an experience of somebody who always pushed things uh, usually above the limit. He'd say, well, if you said the, the peak current was such and such, I'd figure I can go 10% higher or same thing with continuous. And uh, they installed the system, and the, uh, the uh, systems were over-tripping on the motor temperature uh, controller, and that was very annoying because it was actually shutting down an engine line or machining engine blocks, and that's not a good thing to do at all. So uh, if, if you're going to apply peak torque or uh, torque well above the continuous for more than a second or so, I recommend you talk to your uh, an application engineer like, like Jack. Sounds like good advice there. <laughs> All right, let's go on to the next question there. It says, uh, in the system curves used in the presentation, uh, why are there three speed limit lines? Okay, I can take that. This is Jack Curl. Um, there are typically um, uh, one speed limit line uh, per curve in most manufacturers' data sheets. And that and line that describes, describes um, the limit of the back EMF matching, matching the voltage, voltage applied to the drive converted to the DC, to the DC bus. bus. And, and as you as go you higher go in torque, torque, there are more there are IR, IR drop, drop, voltage, voltage drop losses. losses. And, that's and that's where, where as you go as higher in torque, torque, the voltage, voltage line gets, gets, gets uh, narrower, narrower towards, towards the top. The top. And we, and we do three, do three uh, voltage, voltage lines, lines to indicate the plus and minus 10% uh, tolerance, tolerance on an AC, on an AC line, line, which um, allows, allows us to take into take account into the worst case, case AC, AC line. line. So that corresponds to the three lines that are on the graph. You have 10% below, 10% above, plus your nominal. Yes, yes. Very good. Very good. Okay, that well, makes a lot of sense. You want to make sure that it will continue to work even as the voltage drops. Now, uh, next question. I've heard the term inertia matching. What is that, and when do I need to be concerned with it? Okay, I can take that one also. Um, the inertia matching is important when you're tuning the system. Um, which is, which a, is an, an amplifier, amplifier characteristic, characteristic uh, to get higher performance, higher performance out of the out system. Of the system. And, and 
when you're tuning the system, it can be more difficult to tune a uh, large inertial load because of the coupling between the load and the motor. And if the, if the coupling is somewhat flexible, uh, and typically there are flexible couplings out there, then the load can end up not following the, the motor as well. And the larger the load inertia is, the worse that gets. And you get some feedback distortions, which can cause problems with tuning. Oh, okay. okay. That, so, so imagine the inertia, the inertia, of course, then that, that links the tuning systems, systems together so that they match all the way through the process. Then. Yes, as the inertia is matched uh, more appropriately, the, the less those deflections are and uh, the more performance you can get out of the system. Very good, very good. Um, Bosco would like to know if you happen to have any examples of motor sizing uh, when reductions include fleet screws. Yeah, that's a good question. The uh, the appendix, uh, actually, it's appendix A3 uh, goes through the lead screw. Uh, basically, it uh, is derived by saying power, uh, rotary power in is equal to linear power out, or torque times uh, omega uh, out of the motor, or whatever is driving the lead screw, is equal to the force times the uh, linear velocity. Again, if you use MK, uh, MKS uh, units, uh, that will be in watts. And uh, there's a derivation of uh, what the torque uh, requirement is to get a certain force on the load, and it also shows how the inertia is reflected back to the lead screw. So I, I uh, recommend you take a look at Appendix A3. Very good. So have them download the PDF file of the presentation, and they'll get it in the appendix. Yeah. Okay, um, let's see. Tony would like to know, will your sizing calculation for continuous torque take into account the number of cycles the acceleration is needed? Obviously, the motor is going to get hotter than as, it, as you start and stop it over a short period of time. Yeah, that, that basically is the cycle. If you, uh, Depending on what cycle you have, you really want to plot that all out on uh, your uh, uh, is your torque versus time. And, uh, yes, you, if you had a very complicated cycle, you'd have a lot more segments, and the competition might get a little bit more uh, cumbersome, not really more complicated, just more cumbersome, you're just going to have more turns. But uh, you might have six different segments in the cycle, or you might have a linear load, for example, or constant load, I should say. Uh, uh, for example, if you were driving a ball screw and it was an elevator and you were having to hold the load, uh, up in the, the air against gravity, you'd have to generate torque through that entire time, even if it wasn't accelerating, and you'd have to include all that as one of your segments uh, in that big square root uh, equation. But uh, yes, it would take all that into account and give you the correct continuous torque. Right, because basically you're building the time of starting and stopping into the equation to start off with. Um, Okay, this actually, next question is, is directed to Jack. Uh, how did you come up with uh, amperes? I assume that was in the calculation. Yes, um, we, we didn't actually show how we're coming up with amperes in the motor. We just used the system curve that is generated by the manufacturer to show us torque. But basically, um, each motor has a a unit called the uh, KT or um, torque gain uh, unit that tells you how much torque you get per amp in the motor. And uh, if you have uh, an 11 amp drive, for instance, you can take the 11 amps times the KT of the motor, and that would give you the, the torque available in the system. Or you can reverse it. If you need the torque, you can take the KT to determine the number of amps that it's required. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, ben says that he's mi he uh, missed the section how you derive the motor and amplifier size. Um, well, that was most of the presentation, I think. But uh, could you do just a quick overview, uh, possibly as to uh, like a like a summary of how you came up with the motor and amp size? 
the motor and amp side. Yeah, I'm not uh, uh, completely sure I understand the question. I think what uh, Jack showed was uh, the uh, motor being driven by two different amplifiers. One had an 11 amp and the other 17 amp. And the uh, 17 amp drive was able to get basically more out of the motor, particularly in the uh, continuous range, by putting in enough uh, current to uh, get the torque uh, required, the, the continuous torque required. Um, in, in general, uh, you, you, once you calculate all your loads, uh, you would uh, uh, go to your torque speed curves of the motor, and, and typically you'll get torque speed curves of both the motor, the motor with uh, different drives, and you just have to find where those uh, curves met your your requirement. Just a little bit more on current, I think I guess Jack did cover that, but uh, every motor has uh, something called the torque constant, and that basically is meters per amp, or it might be in units of foot pounds per amp or whatever, but um, you basically have to put uh, a given amount of current in and amps to get a given amount of uh, torque and uh, torque out of it, and uh, that's going to, uh, in the end, determine how big an amplifier you need, and, and of course the motor has to be capable of handling that much current too. So I'm not sure I answered the, the question completely, but um, I guess that's the best I can do. Oh, that should help, man. Of course, they can always download the presentation to get the actual uh, details of the calculations. Uh, George here wants to know if any motor manufacturers have water cooled these motors. Okay, I can take that one. Um, yes, there are, there are water cooled motors available in the market, and uh, we happen to manufacture water cooled motors here at Infranor. Um, there, are there are specific, specific to, to the BL, BL series motor fr family, family, which is a uh, standard, standard uh, long, long length style, length style motor. motor. Um, but uh, uh, we, we do we offer, do them. offer them. I assume that you have a slightly smaller motor for or more power for the same size motor being water cool. Helps yeah. to get rid of that excess heat. Yes. Yeah. Next question comes up. Uh, Randy would like to know, uh, does the 20 to 1 gear drive reducer have anything to do with the motor you picked? And basically, how did you pick the gear drive reducer to be 20 to 1? Yeah, hi, thanks. Um, so we picked the gear drive reducer. Really, that was something that the, uh, the, the machine builder picked. Did it, does it affect the selection? Of course it does because it affects the reflected inertia. Um, but uh, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, we didn't pick it to pick the motor. It, we selected the motor based on the reflected inertia and the torque required to accelerate the load. I, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, it's pretty close. Uh, Bob here wants to know uh, what's the typical speed range for a brushless servo motor, uh, like 10 to 1 or 100 to 1. And in this example that you gave, if the customer wanted to run an indexing table at 6 RPM for inspection purposes, do you think that probably would handle it? Okay, this is Jack. I, I think I can take that one. Um, the, the first part of the question, um, typically servo motors are better than a thousand to one speed range and um, can be even much better than that. Um, and the second part of the question, if you wanted to run at six RPM on an indexing table, you might have trouble with the table inertia going directly to the motor, so you may want to gear that with a gearbox. And when you, when you do that, do the that, speed the will speed increase, will increase and, you'll and you'll better, better utilize, utilize the power, the power that's, available that's available in a smaller, in a smaller size, size motor. motor. That would make a lot of sense. Uh, you can, if you can get by with a smaller motor, obviously that's more energy efficient. It looks, gentlemen, though, that like we've run out of time. Uh, on behalf of the uh, Penton Design Engineering and Sourcing Group and Machine Design Magazine, I extend my thanks to you and Infranor for sponsoring this event for us today. And I'd like to send a hearty thank you to you, our attendees, for joining our webcast today. May the rest of your day pass swiftly and productively.